Now, Ask Dr. Love with psychotherapist, author, love and relationship expert, Dr. Jamie Turndorf. For expert advice on love and relationships, you can submit your questions online at askdrlove.com or post comments and questions to Dr. Love while you're watching live over Google Hangouts or YouTube. Now, here's Dr. Love. Welcome to Ask Dr. Love Radio. I'm Dr. Jamie Turndorf, and it is my pleasure to be with you today to talk with Marianne Williamson. Everyone knows she's an internationally acclaimed spiritual author and lecturer, and she's been a popular guest on all the TV programs like Oprah, Larry King Live, Good Morning America, Charlie Rose. Six of her 11 published books have been New York Times bestsellers. Four of these have been number one New York Times bestsellers. A Return to Love is considered a must-read of the new spirituality. And a paragraph from the book beginning, Our deepest fear is not that we are inadequate. Our deepest fear is that we are powerful beyond measure. Is considered an anthem for a contemporary generation of seekers. Now, Marianne's other books include The Law of Divine Compensation, The Age of Miracles, Everyday Grace, A Woman's Worth, Illuminata, Healing the Soul of America, A Course in Weight Loss, The Gift of Change, and a year of miracles. Marianne, if you don't know, is a native of Houston, Texas, and in 1989, she founded Project Angel Food, a Meal on Wheels program that serves homebound people with AIDS in the LA area. And today, Project Angel Food serves over 1,000 people daily. Marianne also co-founded the Peace Alliance, and she serves on the board of directors at uh, the Results Organization, working to end the worst ravages of hunger and poverty throughout the world. And according to Time Magazine, yoga, the Kabbalah, and Marianne Williamson have been taken up by those seeking a relationship with God that is not strictly tethered to Christianity. And without further ado, I just want to introduce you to Marianne Williamson. Are you with me? I sure am. Hi, Jamie. Thank you so much for having me. Thank you so much. I'm so glad to have you. Thank you. I was so excited to hear about your, your new workshop, and I just, you know, I saw your video on your website, and I was really struck by the, the absolute truth of the message that you were presenting. The thing that really struck me was the statement that you made. It's not about attracting the right partner, but about being the right partner. Can, can you share a little more about that? Sure. I'm doing this workshop uh, February 13th through 15th. It's uh, live in Los Angeles, or people can watch it anywhere via live stream. Um, And it's called Invoking the Romantic Mysteries, a weekend about spirituality and relationships. Um, I write books and uh, teach about uh, various uh, aspects of applied spirituality. I think there's one truth with a capital T spoken in many religions, philosophies, and so forth, and I uh, write uh, about A Course in Miracles, but once again, it's the universal spiritual themes that we're talking about. I think that many people are involved in a spiritual path these days, but I think sometimes our conceptualization of spirituality is in a completely different category than our conceptualization around romantic love. And there's a line in A Course in Miracles where it talks about how we think we have many different problems, but we really only have one. And that is our separation from God or our separation from our own spirituality. So this weekend is about realigning our thoughts about a romantic partner with Mm -hmm. the thoughts of the divine. Because right now we think of them as Mm -hmm. such separate categories. And in fact our search, our yearning for that one special person is in a very real way a product of our absence of divine or spiritual connection. Mm -hmm. Because when my spiritual connection is solid, when my primary relationship is with the divine, then I don't think of myself as incomplete. I don't think of myself as needing another person to complete me. Now, when I do think, when I do feel a disconnection from the divine, then I at least subconsciously am looking for someone. I know that I feel bereft. I know that I feel this terrible loneliness in the universe, which is really due to my, to my uh, absence of spiritual connection. But on a subconscious level, I don't know this. So my mind, my ego mind says, go find that one person. Oh, that is so true. Right. So that 
that Thank search for that one special person, while it leads me to search for love, it also makes sure I will never find it. Because once I'm in a relationship, that poor other person has to carry this terrible burden. The burden being, I think I need you to complete me. So that means that subconsciously, I will do anything it takes to make sure that you're here, to make sure that you act in the way I need you to act, to be that which I think fixes me in that moment. So actually, that's a setup. It doesn't actually, you know, when Jerry Maguire said to, you know, it was Tom Cruise in that movie saying mm-hmm. to Renee Zellweger, it seemed sexy at the time, you know, oh, I, you complete me. But the truth of the matter is, and we all know this in our long-term relationships, that the idea that we need another person ultimately does not does not attract it does not foster. It actually, on a deeper level, repels. Absolutely, because you're coming about, like a, a starving, starving bird, right. and the other person senses that you're going to devour me. Right, <laughs> So exactly. So then we're like two emotional invalids joined at the hip rather mm-hmm. than two complete people. On the other hand, when that emotional conversion takes place, you know, to a, a different emotional ground of being where we feel deeply complete within ourselves, then what happens is that we shift from need to desire. And pure desire without need and without the neediness and controllingness and often self-centeredness that comes from, from that sense of need, when that shifts over into pure desire, then I don't want anything from you. I just uh, have a desire to be here in this moment and, hey, let's play. That attracts. And not only does it attract, it keeps attracting because in a very real way, it's, it's magnetic and it's the most powerful love of all. Absolutely. It's so I often say, Oh, the Messiah always comes the day after you need him. <laughs> you know? Oh, like, that's great. <laughs> so that's what we're really talking about. You know, you and I are using different language really for the same message because I always talk about how we when we begin a relationship, we don't even realize we're unconsciously seeing or fantasizing that I'm gonna heal my old scar from childhood through you. You know, you're going to give me all the emotional goodies my mom or my dad didn't give me. And I'm in ecstasy in the beginning because I'm hoping it's going to work out. And then within 18 to 24 months, I've unconsciously either transformed you into the parent I had trouble with or actually chose you because you're like the parent I had trouble with. And now I am bringing all this old baggage, hurt, and anger to you, and it just goes downhill from there. Well, you know, I think that, it is very uh, sort of accepted these days, this idea that when we first fall in love, that all that's happening there is this mutual projection. And then mm. afterwards, reality sets in. But I see it the opposite. What you're saying still remains true, but the perspective changes a little bit. Because when you say you have this fantasy that they're going to heal all the wounds, I don't think that's just fantasy. No, it's reality. Are, well, I think if you do it consciously. Right, I, exactly. And I think that when we first fall in love, we do have this kind of spontaneous enlightenment experience. We are shown, we're like lifted up to the top of the mountain. Mm. But like any spontaneous enlightenment experience, you're shown the top of the mountain, but then you're placed back down at the bottom. You have to climb there yourself. Yes. Yeah. But you, the fact that you've seen where it can be, so I think beautiful. what happens is not that we are in mutual projection and the reality sets in. I think we're in, real, uh, we're in reality and then projection sets in. Oh, I then, agree with you 100%. Right. And the and challenge before, is to, right, to be conscious enough to work together to be these healing agents for each other, right. to make that, that paradise that we saw, that glimpse of heaven, make it real. Right, and when you were talking before about how it becomes one thing or the other, I know uh, the way Harville Hendricks uh, names that. He talks about how you do need meet the person who triggers the childhood wound, like you were saying. Mm. And then in what he calls the old brain, the relationship will just be used by the what the Course calls the ego mind to trigger and re-trigger that old wound, Being but true. in the hands of what he calls the new brain, what the Course would call the, the Holy Spirit, it's used to heal that. And one of the things that we'll be talking about that weekend, in the Course in Miracles, there's this concept of special love and holy love. And special love does, isn't what it sounds like. It's, it's actually the ego's idea of, of the romantic partner, which is what you were saying before. It's just a fantasy that you're going to heal the wound 
and then all the neurotic need that and projection that comes from that from that really sense that you will perform that for me. That's your function is to mm. do for me what I need. So in the courses, there's an interesting idea. It's, it's kind of this idea that we heal through a kind of detox, that stuff has to come up in order to be released. And so I think that it, it, the fact that, li- you know, that that line, love brings up everything unlike itself, the fact that the childhood wound in both people is triggered, and the fact that, we often see in uh, romantic love the deepest shadow in ourselves and other people as well, the other person as well. I think when we have that context that you talk about, that I talk about, that we, you know, this whole conversation is about, then mm. I think we stay it with the realization that this is a kind of hospital for the soul. The, the purpose of this mm. relationship, in part, is that your wounded sides will come up. The purpose of it is that my wounded sides will come up. Because yes. in the space of mutual forgiveness and understanding and compassion, we will heal those wounded places. Absolutely. Otherwise, we'll just go on to other partners and do the Absolutely. You just take it downstream. But the, right. to, to me, the key is what you're saying is so true that we must be so acutely conscious of right. these hurt parts in ourselves, and we sort of bring them, if you want, on a golden platter with great trust. And I say to you, I'm telling you where I was wounded, and I'm entrusting this wounded part of me to you. Please help me, and I will in turn help you. Absolutely. That is the highest and most divine purpose of our intimate relationships. That's what we're talking about. Yes. Exactly. That's exactly the conversation that we're talking about. Yes, and it is it is so exciting because then when you hit those bumpy roads, you you reframe them in your mind as, oh my goodness, I have another chance now to help you heal me, right. and for you right. to, and vice versa. How beautiful! It's, it's very difficult in those moments, isn't it? Because on one hand, and I think this is the tragedy of so many intimate relationships, is how many people leave at that point. Yeah. You know, they think, oh, I've just seen this ugliness in you. You must not be the one. Or I, I've, you've seen this ugliness in me. I'm so ashamed of the fact that that comes up here. I need to leave. And I, mm. um, that's so sad. So when you have that reframing and you have the conscious knowledge that, that, that this coming up is the purpose of the relationship, you know, sometimes you're thinking, oh, this is so terrible. This is just awful. Mm. And, but really the divine is saying, oh, this is good. This, this is good. just where we want to be. That's exactly be. This is what needs to have happen. This is we're in the like eye of the saying. storm because you can't heal until right. you first recreate. Right. It's the ultimate purpose of the relationship that these things did come up. Exactly. Yes, and and that is so, and it's so reassuring when you when you do reframe it in this way. So then I say, oh, isn't that great? Now we're in the eye of the storm. Now exactly. we can heal. And I always use that image, and I'm sure this resonates with you of you know, holding the other in the palm of your hand as just a tiny little delicate bird that's wounded and entrusted to you You know, there's heal. a line in The Course in Miracles where it says, think what you're thinking about a brother that God would not be thinking, and think what God would be thinking that you are not thinking. Yeah. And I remember once, in, when this happened originally, the one I'm going to mention, it was with my mother. But when you apply it to an intimate partner, it's pretty amazing, which is, Dear God, the prayer becomes, Dear God, help me see this person as you see them. Oh, that's because, lovely. And and when you do, I remember when I had that in this spontaneous thing with my mom, and I had a flash of her as like a five-year-old child. And that's such a gift from the divine when you're like shown who that person was yes. on their first day of kindergarten. Yes. You know what I mean? They're just as scared as you are. I think women, yes. particularly with men, we forget they're as scared as we are. Totally, and they are under the straitjacket of the male gender role. I have to be tough. I can't be vulnerable. So it's so much harder for them to be able to admit, I'm hurting, I'm scared. I'm just going to convert it to anger, you know, and spray you like skunk. I remember Pat Allen saying in a a talk I heard many years ago, I remember her saying men are more sensitive than women. And I thought, wow, that's really interesting. And, and she was talking about about the traditional marriage, and she said something that in a lot of relationships is is not the issue of what's happening. But when she said this, talking about the traditional marriage, she I thought this was this really affected me. She said, you know, when you look at the traditional marriage of of um, 
uh, the man and the woman, and let's say they have children. She said, you know, a divorce, he is the one usually who ends up having to leave the house. He's the one who ends up more financially ruined. He's the one who really gets separated from the kids. And even though that's a traditional model that is not everyone's experience, when she said that, I thought, you know, wow, that is really, I I had never thought of that, which is uh, where their terror would be so, so strong. So it's always helped me to remember that uh, men are as sensitive as as I am. Sometimes I think women, we think we're the only ones because we, we, we sometimes externalize it more, but. And another thing she said, Jamie, that I thought was interesting, I wonder what you think about this. She said, she talked about how, you know, you and I, we look at men, let's say a man shoves another man. And Mm -hmm. we go, wow, you guys are rough, you guys are violent. And they're like, no, that's not violent. They see our tongue and our violent Oh, lethal weapon. Exactly. So that you and I would have words, and then two hours later you'd say, hey, you want to go shopping? I'll say, yeah, I'll meet you there. Right. But for a man, we say some things that are rough, and the next morning say you want to go to breakfast, and he's like, go to breakfast after that conversation we had last night? Yeah, right. So I think remembering their sensitivity in the words that we use is Extremely Absolutely, important. that yeah. the words cut very deeply. Right. Speaking of cuts, I just have to take a little break. <laughs> but I'll be back with you in one moment on Thank Ask you. Dr. Love Radio. Dr. Love's Quickies. Wondering how to tell the difference between love and lust? Poor Mark. Every time he takes a woman to bed, he ends up scratching his head. His big head, I mean. How can he tell if he's in love or only in lust? time. Lust usually fades in a few weeks while true love lasts. So when it comes to gauging if you're in love or only in lust, remember you can't trust lust. I'm Dr. Jamie Turndorf of AskDrLove.com. You are listening to Ask Dr. Love with Dr. Jamie Turndorf. Ask Dr. Love is the web's premier relationship advice site since 1996. Visit AskDrLove.com to search thousands of free relationship advice articles on any relationship issue you may have or submit a question to her free advice column. You can also watch this broadcast live over Google Hangouts or YouTube. Sign up for her newsletter at AskDrLove.com to be the first to know about her upcoming radio shows and find out how you can watch her live and ask her questions in real time. Don't be shy. Dr. Turndorf wants to help you. So take advantage of this unique opportunity to get a personal answer from one of today's most respected experts. This show is for you, the listeners. So if you have a question for her, make sure to watch live on Tuesdays from 1 to 2 Eastern Time on Google Hangouts or YouTube. Or catch the archived broadcast on webtalkradio.net. Now, back to Dr. Love. You're listening to Ask Dr. Love Radio with Dr. Jamie Turndorf. I'm talking with the fabulous Marianne Williamson. We're talking about so many things, especially her new upcoming seminar. And, you know, Marianne, before we took the break, I I loved what you said about how you were able to instantly heal your relationship with your mom by seeing her through the eyes of God, really through the eyes of your heart. This is a wonderful, wonderful trick, isn't it? For just, yeah, I mean, I, I wouldn't say that in that moment I instantly healed yeah. my relationship with my mother. I, I think it Thanks. just took more moments than just that one. But it, but is it was a the beginning. Technique, you know, there are ideas in The Course in Miracles and it, it, where, that are referred to as habits, mental habits in your problem-solving repertoire. And mm-hmm. one of those mental habits is praying to see the person as God sees them. Yes. Yeah. And when you do that, just say, I, I know that this person is spiritually innocent, but right now I am so triggered by their behavior, based once again mm. on our own childhood wounds, mm-hmm. that all I can see is the level of their guilt, the level of their mistake, the level of their unkindness, the level of their betrayal, the level of their having said something mean to me, the level of their abandonment. So because I am focused on their guilt, I am going to react to that level of their behavior, thus binding me to that cycle of suffering. So I know that I have to extend my perception beyond the level of their mistake, extend it to a 
to the knowledge, beyond perception, to the knowledge of their innocence. However, I am so triggered by this person right now that, dear God, I can't do it by myself. And that that's what the miracle is, is that shift in perception. And it's amazing when you just pray, say, I am willing to see the innocence in this person. I don't mm-hmm. feel it. I don't see it. But I know it's there because it's in all of us. I am willing to see it. And then what happened for me that particular day mm-hmm. is that I just had this flash of my mother as a little child. But it could be all kinds of things. It could be that something is said that then reminds you of something good that that person had done, some effort that they had made. Also, because all minds are joined, if I say I am willing to see the innocence in this person, they subconsciously feel the blessing, feel your willingness. Your energy shift. Mm -hmm. It's a complete energy shift. You know, I have this technique in my, my new Hay House book, Love Never Dies, where I show people how they can reconnect and also make peace with the deceased. And I have this patient who was relentlessly hateful toward her mom who had been in spirit for decades. And she said to herself, I have a boatload of anger. I can't get past it. So we used my dialoguing with the departed technique and I asked her to talk to her mom. And in the dialoguing, she was still so stuck. And in that moment, I was, you know, illuminated, you know, I got the I, the inspiration to just say, I want you to literally enter into your mother's skin. And I want you in the dialogue now to speak your mother's perspective mm-hmm. on why she did what she did to you. And it was so miraculous. This right. really speaks to what you're saying. As Absolutely. she did this, she began to cry because oh. she instantly felt her mother's pain, her mother's despair. She understood stood her mother in that moment, and she just looked at me and she said, my anger toward her is gone. Yeah, I get it. And that's what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. It's that partial identification. I'm literally stepping into your skin, Mm -hmm. and now I have empathy for you because I feel you. I know what you felt. I know what you went through. Right. And that's what you began with, with you and your mom. And that is so difficult because, you know, so many people are welded to the anger, you know, you know, and I, I don't think it's difficult. What's difficult is getting over the resistance to doing it. Yes. I think that's a really important distinction. The spiritual mindset is not difficult. It's just different. And what's difficult is giving up our resistance. That's why that was, yes. of course, yes. becomes Yes, that, that is the, the nuance. The resistance, when, I, when you say giving up the mindset, I'm sure you see so many people who are welded to being angry. Well, and that I, line, do you prefer to be right or to be happy? Yes. Uh, and we are some, what we're welded to is the perception of someone's guilt, because as long as we think someone is guilty and we see ourselves as victim, then that that is the ego mind, because the ego mind is the perception, the false belief that we're separate, because on the level of the body we are. Mm. So if I'm in my ego mind, my core belief is that I'm separate from you then no matter what I do, I will not have intimate love because I'm tied to the core belief we're separate, so I will continue to perpetuate experiences of separation. And the primary the primary way we do that is through the perception of someone's guilt. Because if yes, I do guilty right. and me not, guilt, by, my, me not guilty, by definition, we, I perceive you as separate from That's me. That's brilliant. And I cannot know love. So That's the victim stance is, is separation. Right. The so victim stand because I'm innocent, you're guilty, and that is a, a diet, you know, a, a paradigm that couples often get trapped in. Right, you and know? in that moment, there's no way we can have an intimate experience of each oh, other because no. intimacy is the experience of our oneness, and we all make mistakes, and that's why in intimate love, this is so significant. D- d- expecting someone to be perfect all the time, or or even having the unrealistic expectation that you're going to be perfect all the time. Okay, let's take a brief, I want to continue with this because this is so important, what you're saying. I'll take a brief break. I'll be back with you in a moment on Ask Dr. Love Radio. You are listening to Ask Dr. Love with Dr. Jamie Turndorf. If you yearn to get along better with your life partner or spouse, friends, family members, and even co-workers, Dr. Love's latest Hay House book, Kiss Your Fights Goodbye, Dr. Love's 10 Simple Steps to Cooling Conflict and Rekindling Your Relationship, shows you how to turn conflict into connection for a lifetime of lasting love. Find out more about this book and even read a free excerpt by visiting AskDrLove.com. 
This is Ask Dr. Love with Dr. Jamie Turndorf. And if you have a question for her, make sure to watch live over Google Hangouts or YouTube, where you can submit your comments or questions and connect with Dr. Love in real time. Or listen to the archived show at webtalkradio.net. This show is for you, the listeners, and Dr. Love wants to hear from you. You're listening to Ask Dr. Love with Dr. Jamie Turndorf. Once again, here's Dr. Love. You're listening to Ask Dr. Love Radio with Dr. Jamie Turndorf. I'm talking with the wonderful Marianne Williams. Williamson. Marianne, before we took the break, we were talking about the illusion of separation as the source of conflict between people, that I'm, I feel the victim, you are the guilty party. So we're talking about how to step free of that, because as long as you're trapped in that paradigm, there is no intimacy. Well, the cornerstone of the ego's thought system, and the ego is the belief in myself as separate, is that someone is guilty. And the cornerstone of the spiritual mindset, which is the intimacy, you know, intimacy isn't something you have to create. How much more intimate can we be than that we are one, created by God as one? So Mm -hmm. intimacy is something we realize in any moment. And the key to that is the perception of someone's innocence. So it becomes an attitude of forgiveness. We think of forgiveness as something, you, you did something, you're a jerk, but I'm spiritual, so I'll forgive you. Well, that's right. really still lost in judgment or separation. Right. But forgiveness is more of a consistent attitude towards life, which is that on the earth plane today and the plane of human drama, you probably will make some mistakes today, and so will I. Yes. But I will seek to keep my eye on the real you. I will seek to keep my eye on the knowledge of your spiritual and divine perfection. And from that, I will be a space in which you are more likely to act from that place because on a subconscious level, you will feel that I salute the best in you. That that is really the purpose of intimate love. It's the purpose of any kind of love. That in my presence, you will more easily rise to your true self. And in my presence, when you don't quite make that, you can't quite make that goal, I, because I will see the truth about you, the the mercy and the compassion that you will feel for me will be so great that you will self-correct more easily. Not because I make you wrong, but because Uh, you yourself are reminded of your divine perfection. Now, you know, I think you would agree that when you injure me, what happens is I go into my baby brain, which is, you know, I I end up flooding because the mistake you've made now activates for me. It rips off the scab of all the old boo-boos. And so now I am flooding with the baby pain. And then I go back into the baby place of I am a victim and I was wronged and you are guilty. So the trick is to be able to harness you know, and take into your arms that hurt baby and help the baby talk in a way that doesn't demonize the other so that you can help the other to help you heal. So in this moment now, you are going to listen and understand me, and I'm going to actually be healing all those old wounds that have been awakened by this current little mistake. But that involves, I talk a lot in Kiss Your Fights Goodbye about how you have to be as cool as possible because if you allow the baby in you to lash out and scream and demonize, well, now the other person is not available to help you in this healing. And that is... I think that's very true. I also think it's true that when you make uh, God your primary relationship, God, however you understand God, whatever whatever word, then you are looking to the divine to reparent you. I think that oh, I that's, love that. that's the issue. When you allow the divine to reparent you, then you're not even looking to that situ- that situation coming up, what you just described. If if in that moment of that you were talking about, it you the the trigger you, the wound is triggered, you're flooded as you said. Then the first thing to do is not to even figure out what to say to the other person. First thing you do is go to God. First thing you do, you develop that as a habit pattern. Spirituality is a set of mental and emotional habit patterns. You go first to God, and one of three things will happen. First of all, you will realize that this, is, this has nothing to do with the other person, that this is simply about nothing that even had to do with them, that this is about your healing, that separation from God, which is what was reflected by the childhood experience. Right. Number two, it does have to do with the other person, 
but the forg- that's, a, that's first category. Second category, it does have to do with this person because, remember, their wounds are being triggered here too. Right. So it does have to do with your relationship with the other person, but what's called for here is a shift in your own perception into forgiveness, and it would not serve to say a word. The third category is that you realize what happened, your wound was drawn up, they were in their wound to even attack you or do whatever they did. Something does need to be communicated, but as you were saying, you, the spirit will come over you and you, you will communicate in such a different way. You totally. won't say things like, you made me feel. You will say totally. things like, you I... know, in that moment when that happened, I felt. You won't come with this emotion-backed energy, which is itself an attack, Yes. But rather, you will be coming from this clear, neutral space of simply revealing and sharing and not attacking. Absolutely. So and then in that why... respect, you are really turning your partner into the physical embodiment of God. Because well, I'm now allowing you to, I'm loving you as I love God. I'm letting God love me through you. It's as if God is really the third entity here. and it's, Well, it's the third entity, which is in, uh, entity definitely the mystical third, which I think is very different than turning the partner into the embodiment of God, because turning the partner into the embodiment of God <laughs> is what gets you into big trouble. Oh, you mean if you're kind of like the... You see the partner is the source of your, of, of, of your good, and that does not help the relationship. It's not that God is outside us, but no. it's, it's higher than either of us in our minds, and I... Uh, so to me, it's not turning the partner into the embodiment of God. But if I see, if I am looking at anyone through the mental filter of my alignment with God, then because I am one with the divine in my perception, I'm going to have right-minded perception of you. When my relationship with God is fractured, if I'm, if I'm neurotic in my, you know, Freud-defined neurosis is separation from self. Right. So I'm separated from God. I'm separated from myself with a capital S and lost in myself with a little s. So my relationship with you, by definition, will be fractured because I'm fractured within myself. Mm-hmm. So it's a, it's a sense of a mystical third, absolutely. And that's why I was saying, and that's what this weekend is about, is realizing that the, the, the very practical and very real ways, emotionally, psychologically, and, and spiritually, that our relationship to God impacts um, our relationship, particularly intimate relationships with other people. May, I would like to tell you a story that I have never told on Ask Dr. Love before, if I may. It's a, it really speaks to what we're talking about here. I, I talk about how our reconnection with loved ones in spirit is our fast track to self-love. And I describe the fact that I, as many therapists, was raised in a very abusive household. My mom verbally abused me and physically abused me. So did my dad. Now, my husband was one of the most loving beings. You know, he, for most of his life, had been one of the most famous Jesuit priests, and he was so loving to me. But there was always some kind of a barrier that his love didn't really fully enter me. And I'd never really felt true self-love because there was always the voices of the parents being very, very mean to me. And after he left his body... I went to my professional group in the city, and I was talking about this. You know, I've tried my whole life to be able to, you know, have God's love for me, my love for myself, and I still hear these horrible, mean, horrible voices beating on me and putting me down. You know, the professional group was saying, you know, you have just got to out-yell those parents' voices. Let our voices be a substitute and just out-yell them. It did not work. So I come back from the city, and my husband appears to me as a visitation, and he's surrounded in golden light. He takes my face in his hands and he turns me toward the light. And all he says to me is, listen, listen, listen. And I knew what he was saying was, listen to my love and allow it to enter you. And in that moment, I felt this incredible penetration of his love. It was like now that he was freed from the vessel of his body, his love for me could enter unimpeded and become my self-love. And it was an instant transformation for me that I couldn't, I just couldn't experience when he was in his body. And I realized this was how I got, reconnecting with our loved ones in spirit who have such abundant, you know, know, eternal love for us. 
that is our way of loving ourselves because so often, you know, our loved ones really are our intercessors to God. And that if we yeah, can that's ha- a very profound story. You're yeah. very such a fortunate woman to have that kind of uh, experience that continues after the physical death of your late yeah. husband. That's very profound. Thank you for sharing that. I'm glad to share it with you because it has really transformed my whole life, you know, because I'm a mainstream therapist here, and suddenly now I'm propelled into a completely different trajectory yeah. because I, I totally, totally get now that we are all meant to reconnect with our loved ones in spirit, that heaven's a state, not a place, It's you know, death yeah. is an illusion, and that if we do connect with them in the way that I, I share that we all can do, uh, we heal and find this profound self-love. And ultimately, I mean, I know you believe this as much as I do. We're here to perfect our ability to love right. ourselves first and others, you know, second. I mean, we can't love others if we don't love ourselves first. But I think we can't, I, I don't know, I, I, I actually feel we can't love ourselves until we, unless we love others, too. So it goes, I think it's have to think I have to get my self-love together before I can love you because once we know that on the level of spirit there is only one of us here and in that quantum field there is no separation the very notion i have to love myself before i love you still yes i see what you're separate yes because there are a lot of hours in the day i always tell people you can work on both oh definitely Um, because you can't be that dualistic it is sort of it's a happening all simultaneously Yeah. also if i'm if i'm perceiving guilt in you and focused on your mistakes and your guilt i can't experience uh Self-love. So, because myself with a capital S does not stop at the confines of my skin. You know, no. seeing, for instance, when you talk about your late husband, the whole idea is that he's not he's not limited to his physical body. But that's right. true of us when we're on this earth as well. The real you is not limited to your physical body. Exactly. So, my realization of you as more than your body is the realization of truth. And so self-love lies within that field. Um, so I think this whole, i got to love myself before I love you, I think, you know, the ego is very sly and very insidious. And it's always coming, coming up with reasons and excuses why I don't really have to work on forgiving you. Uh, <laughs> now, it's very interesting because, you know, Harville and I talked a lot about this. We did this six-part series, and then he came on Ask Dr. Love, and we've been talking a lot about this topic of forgiveness. And, you know, many, many years ago, my old supervisor, Lou Ormond, who himself studied under Hyman Spotnitz, who was trained by Freud. So it was like I was practically <laughs> trained by Freud. And Lou made this distinction between acceptance versus forgiveness. And Lou always said, you know, forgiveness is a tricky thing because sometimes you can push down feelings in a narrow grave, but they're not resolved. And Lou always said, I prefer people to come to a place of acceptance. I understand you. I understand your limitations. I accept what you did, as opposed to trying to ram forgiveness down my throat. So what do you think about that? I think spiritual forgiveness is neither one of those. I think he's right about the discernment of a potential uh, problem, but I think he's incorrect about the answer. The, what, the first thing that he mentioned is like what I was saying a few minutes ago. It's the old-fashioned notion of forgiveness, which is the Course calls forgiveness to destroy. It's further judgment, and it's posing as forgiveness, but really it's a perception that you're a jerk, but because I'm so spiritual, I will forgive you now. It's mm-hmm. often referred to as a spiritual bypass. It's this idea that, you know, I talk like this, and therefore it sounds like I forgive you, but really <laughs> when right, you have right. turn, my knives will come out. You know, it, it's, so he's absolutely right about that. Real forgiveness is not where I suppress my emotions. Yes. On the other hand, it, this, what he suggested is the solution is not spiritual forgiveness. If I only come to acceptance, it's like tolerance. Tolerance is still judgment. So the but, old forgiveness that he described, the, they're both judgments. Both things he described imply uh, uh, judgment. The spiritual notion of forgiveness is neither one. Because the spiritual notion of forgiveness is, 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 is an act of grace. It is a spiritual move. It goes beyond the mortal mind. It's that I am willing to, to recognize, recognize the, the, the truth in you and to understand that, uh, that 
the mistakes of this world are simply the mistakes of this world. They is not, are not who and what you are. That does not mean you are not to be held accountable. It does not mean that we will not have boundaries here. It does not mean that I'm incapable of saying no. Sometimes love expresses itself with the word no. Yeah. But it does mean that I am way beyond acceptance. I am in, God doesn't just accept us. He loves us. When right. I make it, the, the purpose of our lives from a spiritual perspective is to learn to love each other as God loves all of us. And That's when I make mistakes, God doesn't just accept me. He knows that the real me didn't do that. He knows yes. that in that moment when I downloaded the wounded part of me, and that's what I put on the screen of my experience, that the perfection in which he created me is an undeletable file. I remain the real Marianne, even in a moment when Marianne acts like a jerk. Oh, and you don't God, act like a jerk. <laughs> well, we all have moments when we, we do. I'm I have to take a break. I refuse. I can't accept <laughs> I'm taking a break. I'll be back in a moment on Ask Dr. Love Radio. Dr. Love's Quickies. Mary's about ready to give love the shove because no matter what she tries, guys don't know that she's alive. To turn guys on, she needs to turn on those green lights, nonverbal cues that say, over here. Most guys won't approach unless they're cleared for landing. So ladies, to kickstart your love life, turn on those green lights and flash your pearly whites. I'm Dr. Jamie Turndorf of Ask Dr. Love. You are listening to Ask Dr. Love with Dr. Jamie Turndorf. To submit your questions to Dr. Turndorf live on the air, sign up for her free newsletter at AskDrLove.com and get the details on how you can connect with her on Google Hangouts or YouTube during her live broadcasts or listen to the archived show at WebTalkRadio.net. If you've recently been through a breakup and are looking for a second chance, wondering how you can reconcile with your ex or if it's even possible after all you've been through, Dr. Love's book, Make Up, Don't Break Up, presents her proven five-step plan for reconciling with your ex. This plan was developed over years of research, working with thousands of couples at her Center for Emotional Communication. This is a proven, no-hype, no-nonsense method that gets right to the root of the problem and shows you how to reignite the spark and rekindle your love. For more about Make Up, Don't Break Up, visit AskDrLove.com. And now, back to Dr. Love. You're listening to Ask Dr. Love Radio with Dr. Jamie Turndorf. I'm talking with the brilliant Marianne Williamson. So we're talking about, I mean, you just blow my mind. I've never encountered anyone with a a mind like yours, Marianne, because it is so it is so flexible, and you're so able to weave in and out of topics and find the kernel of truth in every everything you say. Have, have you always been this way, or did it just develop through your own personal growth? Well, first of all, thank you. I think you're very generous with what you said. Yeah. I've been a student of the Course in Miracles since the 1970s, mm-hmm. and. Uh, it's just, you know, the course does not claim to be for everyone. It's, it's, it, it, it's not, and it, if it's for you, you know it. But one thing that it is, it's a statement of uh, universal spiritual truths, and the Course in Miracles says at their peak, uh, spirituality and psychotherapy are the religion and psychotherapy are their same, the yes. same thing. So the psychological perspicacity that you get from an in-depth study of spiritual principle. If you study in-depth psychological principle, this does not of itself give you spiritual wisdom. But if you study in-depth spiritual uh, uh, understanding, it by definition, it does give you psychological understanding. So the understanding of those principles gives you a capacity to, you, you become like Eloise at the, at the plaza, she goes up, she goes down, she goes to the east, to the, to the west, to the, you know what I'm saying? It just gives you access to so many, uh, so many levels of understanding. This is where I went in my mind. This is where I went in my behavior. This is where I went in my spirit. This is where yeah. I went. So, yeah, and it's tremendous. It's sort of like a, a two tracks are running or multiple tracks. There's exactly. so much consciousness of all the different elements that are running, my mind, my body, my spirit. Right. It's all happening at the same because moment. Because once you see the imprint, and that's, that's the beauty of it, once you see that they're not separate categories, that it's all just a matter of how your mind works, and instead of trying to apply spirituality here, psychology over there, man-woman stuff over here, once you know that this... Separation again. Imprint, pardon? 
that separation again. Right, exactly. And once you see that there's this universal imprint that is on all facets of our lives and you apply that imprint to everything, then it really gives you in, insight. And I love that word, insight, that, uh, you know, obviously frees us if we allow that insight to uh, influence our behavior, which, of course, ultimately becomes where the rubber meets the road. Exactly. So now would, I would love for everybody listening to hear more about, if, you know, how the workshop is going to shape up. Would you, would you be willing to talk about that, I'm what everyone to do that. And now it will begin on Friday night at 7.30 on February 13th from 7.30 to 10 on Friday night. Although people who do this on live stream, of course, will have the live stream for uh, access for a month so they can listen to it anytime they want. And all of this information you can get to through Marianne.com, M-A-R-I-A-N-N-E. So that night I'll be talking about creating a sacred space for love. You know, we cultivate our vegetable gardens more than we cultivate our romantic <laughs> relationships. We don't yeah. tend the garden. I'm sure you'd agree with that, right? I use the analogy of, it's far less uh, poetic, I use the analogy of a car. That I say, you exactly. know, if, we don't put gas in it, would be we don't dead in the, the oil, we don't wash it. Put oil in it, you don't do anything for it. And if you're, 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 your wife or your spouse, the car is dead exactly. in a ditch. There, yeah. Exactly. So a lot of that, that Friday night is really introducing the spiritual context. The, in the morning on Saturday, there will be a lot about forgiving the past. Uh, we, you know, the past only exists in our mind. Uh, but as Faulkner said, the past isn't over. And the fact, in fact, it's not even past. And we, we take what the Course in Miracles calls shadow figures, and we bring them into the present with us. So that my husband just spoke to me, but really it was my father speaking through him, and I'm not healed with my father, and this is the reenactment of that wound or whatever. So yep. clearing up the past is what that morning is about. The afternoon is about the love as a skill set. You know, we go around hoping that one day I will find love. But love oh, is yeah. something you find. Love <laughs> is, is the nature of the universe. Love is yeah. something that you you open your inner eye to see in every moment. It becomes a consistent way of looking at the world. Um, and so really what all that is about and how we, how we develop not only in our minds but also even in our lifestyle. I mean, there are so many ways. You know, when, you're, when, when you have a child, everybody understands that the child needs to have self-esteem and the parent needs to build up the child's self-esteem. Well, at what age do we stop needing that? Yeah. And yet sometimes we are so right. willing to shower our children with, you're so great, you're so brilliant, you're so beautiful, you can do it. Right. But when was the last time you said that to your partner? Exactly. You need to <laughs> you know, and, and see your part, speak to your partner and see your partner through the eyes of your heart and feed your partner every day, every day with, Words and gestures of love. Absolutely right. You know, I, I always say, Marianne, love is not a noun, it's a verb. It's an exactly. action. It's a right. participatory emotion. It's not passive. And yes. of course, that's the essence of narcissism. Give it to me. Give it to me, babe. Yeah, right. <laughs> right. And then when right. you don't, I'm a victim and I get to dump on you and we're back to that again. Right. right. Exactly. Love is and an that act. whole idea, a lot of the weekend is dealing with the thing that you and I were talking about earlier, which is that the relationship is a laboratory of the spirit. It's a hospital of the soul. It's the understanding that things will come up. Also, a lot of discussion about the masculine and the feminine and how the masculine experiences the other as opposed to the feminine, which is as true for gay relationships as for straight relationships. Yeah. And understanding a little more of that, because I think when we understand more of that, we recognize that what feels like love to us might not be what feels like love to the other person. And, and now so we, are you talking about like the love language concept of to me, if you touch me, I feel loved, words do nothing for me? Well, I it, thought that book was good. You mean that five... Uh, your different love language, because people will often get into this merger thing. Well, you know what? I want words, so therefore I'm going to shower you with words, and words right. don't mean a thing to right. me. Right, exactly. So not treating exactly. you as extension of myself. Right. I'm not an expert on that. I mean, I agree with all that. I think it's fascinating, but the, it's not a conversation I'm, I'm expert at. But the one that I do deal with and will deal with in the um, weekend has more to do with the Jungian concept that 
a man's greatest psychic craving is that his thoughts be respected, and a woman's greatest psychic craving is that her feelings be cherished. Mm -hmm. So sometimes when we coddle a man's feelings, like how are you feeling, how are you feeling all the time? He doesn't want you take care of the feelings of a boy. You don't take care of the feelings of a man. And when right. you do much taking too much caretaking of a man's feelings, you are mothering him. And right. a man is hormonally programmed to lose his erection around his mother. And yeah, so, that's uh, an incest taboo right, right there. So it's very difficult to mother a man's feelings. You you can't do that and remain the object of his sexual affection. That's very well said. So all Absolutely. of that stuff it comes into play and the the whole weekend is just a very deep inquiry of our past and of our present um i think a lot of the people who will be there will be couples because like you said you know taking care of the car um is so important it's unbelievable sometimes and i'm sure you have this experience all the time uh of being with couples and being shocked at the way they treat each other oh boy and, it's and true. Course, it's, I always people. tell this story, Marianne. I had this couple come in. And they were taking turns verbally bashing each other. It was so foul to watch. And finally, after I saw them do their dog and pony show, I just looked at them and I said, where did you guys ever get the idea that it's allowed to That's treat right. each other this way? And they kind I'm of blinked. That. Like That's a, that would be thrown, profound to hear. Mm-hmm. Yes, like I'd thrown cold water on them. Really? We didn't know that. So I said, no, you can go home and do this for free, but I'm telling you, it's against God's law what you're doing. So I never saw them again, and I always wondered what happened to these people. And it was such a divine gift for me. I'm walking on 47th Street in New York City in the Jewelry District, and the woman walks up to me. This is years later. She says, I just want you to know, after that session, it was such an eye-opener for us. We never mistreated each other after that, and we've been happy. Well, we live at a time. Uh, first of all, there's the over-casualization. People, people relax too much in their intimate relationships. Like, oh, yeah, well, you know, I know you're here. And we, we treat Take you for granted. The, right, and exactly. Taking for granted and saying things that you would never say almost to a stranger. But I think also this is as important for single people because some of the best work we do on relationships is when we aren't actually in one at the time. And a lot oh, yeah. of people know, let me clean this up, work on this before I even get into a relationship again, or I'm just going to repeat the same old pattern. Yes, that is so true. And, of course, it is, you're not as activated when you're not in a relationship, so you don't maybe have fresh you know, meat to throw on the grill, but you certainly can remember where things didn't go as well as you would have liked and you in your last... you work on that so that the next time you do have meat on the grill, you, yeah. you've got yeah. your chops. That's a real <laughs> metaphor there, but... <laughs> yeah. 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 So it sounds like it's going to be such a fascinating and healing workshop. Thank you. And I really, really support you in this. I'm so glad that, you know, it's funny, I didn't tell you this. Um, I, I had been thinking about you and wanting to have you come on Ask Dr. Love. So I just sort of put the thought out. And the next day, we connected. It was just wow. like it. And. I just thought, wow, the timing was just so perfect, and you guys, I guess, sensed my being, you know, so eager to meet you finally after all these years of loving you from afar. So I was so happy, are you know. Are you in New York, or where are you? I am, you know, and I was thinking, you come to Omega sometimes, right? I'm in New York every once in a while. I haven't been recently, but I will be yeah. there again at some point. And I think if you do, you do Omega, I live pretty near Omega. I'm in Dutchess mm-hmm. County. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So I hope well, I get to see you in the flesh. Well, I appreciate <laughs> that so much. And it's always fun to, I think one of the ways that you know that something is true uh, in life is that it dovetails with everything else you know is true. And I think when it comes to systems of philosophy and spirituality and psychology and so forth, Mm-hmm. Part of the delight we have uh, available to us is that this book or this teaching or this person presents truth through this filter or this, uh, uh, mm. you know, uh, stained glass is one color and then another's is different. You know, okay. in in terms of what you and I were talking about before, I want to mention something. I saw something on Twitter the other day. Um, mm-hmm. And I don't want to say who it was. It's actually someone whose writing I admire um, and wouldn't want to sound like I was critical of the person, but they had that they put out this this share graphic that I saw going around, mm-hmm. and it was 
I'm not going to have sex with you just because it's not my job to have sex with you just because you're horny. It's not my job to please you just because you're bored. It's not my job to, I don't know what it It is. It sounds hateful. It sounds kind of hateful. Well, what it was was I thought to myself, then you will never know love. I mean, it was so, it was looking at the partner almost as an enemy. Don't yes, and all the things you're demanding of me, as opposed to it is my heart's job to be as as present to you as I can be. That why am I in the relationship otherwise? We have made wrong the concept that we are here to to seek to make each other happy, not in the sense that I can complete you or in anything. I, like that, but it's what you were saying earlier that we were talking that you do develop the capacity to say nice things. I, w- I want to put it this way: this is a great story. It's about the late... I mean, and I can't even believe it. Uh, we, we're at the end of the show, and I could talk to you for another 10 hours. Do I have time to tell this one little story, or we don't have time? Well, can you do it in like 30 seconds? Okay, yes, I can. So the okay. man says to me, you should be more like my wife. He was my friend. I kept telling him about my problems with, my, with men. He said, you should be more like my wife. You should be more like my wife. One day, we go to lunch, and he starts telling... The three of us, he starts telling the story. I had heard the story before. I thought, if I've heard it before, she must have heard it five times. But the <laughs> whole time, while I'm listening, I'm watching her, and she's looking at him like he's, he's just... The, like she's fascinated by the story. At the end of the story, she looks at me, and she says, she says oh, darling, you're so brilliant. And she looks at me and she says, oh, Marianne, isn't he brilliant? And I'm thinking to myself, no, you're brilliant. Yeah, that's hilarious. <laughs> that is a perfect example of what you're talking about, of how we are really here to lift each other up and feed right, each other. I was a woman who would have said, oh, honey, I've heard Do I have to hear this story again? <laughs> we learn from all we our learn, little mates everywhere, our little helpmates. It's wonderful. Well, thank you so much for having me on your program. I really appreciate it. I really enjoyed meeting you, and my door is always open to you. Anytime you want to come back, I'd love to have a visit with you again. Thank you very much. God bless you, and good luck with your book. You too, and have a wonderful workshop. Talk to you again. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. That's all I have for you on Ask Dr. Love Radio, and I will see you very soon.